I'll be good. <laughs> so today, what I want to talk about is the eight, uh, the six principles behind crafting a great developer experience. Whether you're building a product for external usage, or whether you're building something that's only going to be used by your internal teams and internal developers. So my name is Adam Kelsey. I work for uh, uh, WebEx, uh, Cisco WebEx, doing developer relations. All my contact information is there. It will also be at the end, so you don't feel like you need to commit now. If you're not sure that you want to say anything to me or you want to see anything, wait until the end. The slides will be there again. Also, if I say something really, really stupid throughout the course of this talk, my Twitter information is there on the lower right hand, lower right corner of every single screen. And to get some of the important information out of the way quickly and to go through some of the questions that we'll surely get throughout the course of the week, uh, they're all right there as well. <laughs> So I work for Cisco, and uh, more specifically, I work for Cisco WebEx. And WebEx is uh, an interesting behemoth that I didn't understand when, when we joined Cisco originally, how big Cisco WebEx actually is. Most conference calls that happen in the world happen over WebEx. We have over a 50% market share in the meetings and the conference call space. So this is a giant, giant platform. And in fact, it's one of the world's largest SaaS platforms. And so more specifically than Cisco WebEx, I work on Cisco WebEx for developers. So one of the world's largest SaaS platforms, it used by enterprises everywhere, and it has an API. So today we're gonna to talk about building a developer experience. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about user experience. So user experience, it's a term that a lot more people have typically heard than developer experience. User experience is creating a product that is a delight for people to use. It's software for people. And it's not just graphic design where you make something look nice. User experience is about making a product work the way that people expect it to work. The idea is to make it very easy and comfortable for someone to achieve their goals. So some examples from the real world, Medium is designed around creating a user experience for editing content and creating content. And everything they do is focused on that, on creating a great experience for someone that is writing and creating content. OXO is a company that makes kitchen tools, and their focus is on making everyday home tasks better. <coughs> but user experience isn't just what you see on a page. So people wouldn't come flocking to a new social media site if it had a better design, or if it was easier to use, because frankly, Facebook is pretty hard to use, and it's still big. The reason that people wouldn't do that, the, the reason that people continue to use Facebook is because all of their friends are there. That is part of the user experience. The size of their network is part of the user experience of Facebook. And likewise, Amazon is obsessed with the shopping experience and then making the shopping experience better for users. But it's not just product search or what the product listing page looks like or how well checkout works. Things that also go into their user experience are the selection of products, the fact that almost anything is available on Amazon, that it becomes the first place you go think to shop because everything's there. Prime two-day shipping, the site performance, customer service, all of these things are part of the overall user experience of Amazon. In fact, I had a friend that was working for Amazon and what she worked on was the related products so when you see, here's the product, here customers that also, that looked at this, also bought this. She got paged on a holiday weekend because that related products widget fell out of performance parameters. And it fell one thousandth of one percent of a second below how quickly Amazon, the minimum threshold for performance. So that's what the user experience is like, is thinking about those sorts of details for users all the time. 
And so there's a lot of disciplines involved in user experience. And the biggest part is thinking about it, about your software, about your product, from the standpoint of the user and not the standpoint of the company or the product. So developers are people too. Well, most of them. So how do you help a developer accomplish their goals? That's what developer experience comes into. So developer experience is all built around answering the question, how do we make our fellow developers more awesome? The idea is to create and execute a vision of how you want a product to feel to a developer. And that's more than just the API design. That's more than, than how a developer portal looks. As an overall product, how do you want this API and the developer, when they think about building with your API, what feelings do you want them to have? And that is your developer experience. The way you do this is you be Go, go about this being user-centered. So people don't buy this thing because they really want to own a drill. Well, some of them. But for the most part, people buy this because they want to put a hole in something. And so the, de the designers of drills understand that, and they think through about, OK, if somebody wants to put a hole in something, what is the, what is, how do I Think about that from a user-centered experience. Well, getting rid of cords is a good idea because if I have to find an electrical cord, then that means I can only put holes in things within range of an electrical outlet. And I can't go put holes in things in the park because there's no electrical outlets in the park. I'll probably also get arrested, but. So by having a very deep understanding of what the developer is trying to accomplish, you can go through and build a great developer experience. So why does developer experience matter? So the, the common trope that we hear, the common reason that we hear, is because developers are busy. So we need a good developer experience because developers are busy, they don't have time. If they come along and they get a bad experience, they'll go find something else and, and do something else. And that's true, but that's true of user experience as well. People are busy. If people can't figure out how to use your product, they'll, they'll go on and do something else. So the reason this is different with developers is, unlike everyday users, developers have a lot more options than just using your product. They have a lot more substitutes. They can go grab another product that's a competing product of yours. They can grab something open source and either use it as is or customize it. They can build it themselves because they're developers. And, and in fact, that's one of the first things that most developers think is, I could probably build that. And so you have to overcome, your, the, the competition for your product is, yeah, I could probably do that myself, and the overconfidence of a developer. So this is the familiar marketing reason for why you need a developer experience, but there's a lot more reasons than that. So for example, reducing your onboarding efforts for a developer coming on, making it easier for a developer to get set up and keep going doesn't just help the developer, it helps you because your support efforts go down. You have to spend less time helping people get started and self-service scales. But what if these other developers, what if you're not building a product that you're trying to sell to developers and these other developers are just your coworkers and the people sitting next to you? Well, if the other developers won't use your tools, they're probably duplicating effort. You have a lot of duplication of effort. And in a company, you probably don't want everybody coming up with another, yet another database abstraction layer. Because first of all, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of resources. They could be working on something better. And then at some point in your life, you're going to be asked to work on that other database abstraction layer. And it's going to suck. And so you want to build quality developer tools internally with a quality developer experience so that people will use them so you don't have to use their badly created tools. All about being selfish here. The other thing is that self-service scales. And so onboarding and support, especially for internal tools from your coworker, those general, how do I get started with this, where do I deploy the container? How do I set my credentials? All of this information, it's time consuming. 
for you to go through and ask, answer those questions. And your day job is not to support this thing that you just created internally. So if you make it easy for someone to get started, and you make it easy for them to keep on going, without you, without your help, that's going to save you a lot of time. Another advantage of creating a great developer experience for internal tooling is it makes it easier to ship something publicly or open source this later on because it's already baked in. The, the developer experience is already there, so it's easier for other developers to get going, which means it's easier for developers of your open source product or when you launch something as a product to get going. Amazon very famously builds all of their internal tooling and, and services as public-facing services and only then uses it themselves. They build it first for AWS and then let their internal teams use it. So this can kind of be the reverse of that Amazon model. If everything internal is publicly shippable, it's going to make you be better. It's going to make it easier for people to onboard and easy to get going. It's going to help out with duplication and speed the output of engineering in your company. The other thing is, is that this will encourage a lot more internal tool building. Once people discover in your company that they that when they release something, some internal dev tooling, that they don't just suddenly create a lot more work for themselves. Once they see you as a role model for how to create a good developer experience around this, they're going to start building out their own tools, and that's going to give you a lot more toys to play with. So what goes into developer experience? There's a number of things, API design, discovery, pricing, what it does, how does it do it, who does it. Um, support is part of this. A trial and testing mechanism where somebody, how do I get, how do I use this, how do I test it? Documentation, the tools, the downloads, the developer portal, and trust, all of these things are part of a developer experience. And so when you start thinking, I need to create a good developer experience, you don't just start by saying, what's the website look like? Where do the docs go? You think about all of these things just like you would with a product. So the six principles of a developer experience. The first principle is, it's easy to understand. What does this thing do? What is it designed to be used for? What is it not designed to be used for? Why do I use this? How would I use this? It's also the ease to understand is how to use it. Your documentation, your quick start guides, your tutorials. This is mostly communications and the communications you put out to your developers and to your developer community. Again, whether those are internal or external. And the important thing here is in all of this documentation to be very authentic and be very honest. Don't say your product does something that it doesn't do. Don't gloss over things. Developers have a very low tolerance for everything, um, but especially for BS and for marketing. And, and so be authentic with this and, and don't try and sell to them and don't try and market in your, in your documentation. The other thing to be easy to understand is use terminology that your users use. Don't make up words. Worse, don't use an existing word for, an ex for a concept that it doesn't match. It's really tempting to be unique in your product documentation, in your, in your communications, for marketing or for brand purposes, or to make it easier for you to be found on Google, or, or to make it easier for your Twitter searches on support things to, to come up. Don't do this. Use the terminology your users use. Don't make them learn you in order to start using you. Avoid company jargon. Avoid internal jargon. So I joined Cisco through acquisition. We made a, uh, we were a product called Tropo that we made a telephony API. And our API had this concept called DIDs in it. Who here knows what a DID is? There's no one from the telephony. Ah, oh, there's somebody from the telephony background here. A DID is a phone number. We should have just called it phone numbers because that's what everybody wanting to use this wanted to, to call it. So avoid this industry jargon unless you're only building for the industry. If you want your API to be opaque and you want to make sure people outside your industry can't use it, and that's a valid use case, fill it with industry jargon so that somebody has to be an expert in your industry to use this. 
The second principle is it has to be easy to use. So before somebody starts building, can they start using your tools? How do they get going? How, is, how easy is this? So the ease of sign up is part of this, and not just how simple is your sign up form, but can a developer try out your product without committing to it? Do I need to sign a contract? Do I need to talk to a salesperson who is going to bother me every day for the rest of my natural life, and after I move companies, somehow they're going to track me down and continue emailing me and my progeny, and someday my grandchildren will be getting emails from the salesperson. <laughs> Everybody that's a developer in here is nodding their head and, and chuckling because that's the experience you expect when you talk to a salesperson. So make it easy for somebody to try without committing. <laughs> Fill out a form, give them free trial. If, it, if it's a paid product, then it has to be a paid product because you're consuming physical resources or there's, there's hard costs to you. And maybe the way that you consume your product is you, somebody has to sign up for a contract and you invoice them monthly. Well, don't do that if you want them to try it, at least on the trial side. Give them a credit card option that they can put in a credit card and, and get going. Make sure they have access to API keys, the API itself, the documentation, the sandbox, all the things that somebody would need to try out your product. And don't put any gatekeepers in the middle. Don't make them talk to someone. Don't make them ask for something. Don't make them ask for an API key to something. I was working with this great API one time, and I, through the course of it, I needed to generate several API keys. And there's no mechanism on their website for doing it. And the way you do it is you email their support and tell them what your use case is, and they email you back an API key. Well, I happened to know the founder, so I was texting him, hey, I need another API key, and he texted me right back. So I was getting him in 30, 40, 50 seconds, and that felt long. Imagine how the developers felt that had to email someone and Boy, I got really excited about this on Friday night, and Monday morning someone's going to email me back an API key when I'm not interested anymore. Get the gatekeepers out of the way. Make it easy to use. Provide dashboards and user portals that allow somebody to manage apps and access logs and revoke keys and all the things you think someone might want to do as a developer. Give them a way of doing that themselves. And in fact, in the early days, it doesn't matter how ugly those tools are. If you have an internal support tool that revokes access keys, put it on the web and let people use it. Now, secure it first, please, so that you can only revoke your own access keys. Don't let me revoke other people's access keys, uh, because I will. But give people the ability to do this. And the other part about being easy to use, even before somebody starts coding, give them documentation, give them examples in multiple programming languages. Don't make me, when I'm trying to decide if this tool is fit for my purpose and how much time I need to estimate for development, translate in my head from Java, which I can kind of read and hate to do it and jab myself with needles every time I have to, into Ruby or JavaScript or other programming language that make me want to jab needles into my arms. If you find a programming language that doesn't want to make you sad yourself, let me know. Um, but provide it in lots of programming languages, in as many as you can. And, and this is hard, but do this to provide an ease of use for the, your, your developer experience. And another bit is the third principle is that it's easy to build on. Once somebody has started building on your API, how hard is it? So you want to give them SDKs to abstract away complicated concepts and hard to do things. Code samples for everything common. If you have something in your API that requires four or five API calls in a row to accomplish something, maybe they need to set up a user, and then they need to create a project for that user, and then they need to provide them a code sample that does those steps in that order and shows them how to do it. Rather than saying, well, the code to create a user is here, and the code to set up a project is here, and here's some text that says these are the order you need to do things. Don't make me think about how to do that. If it's super common and everyone needs to do it, make sure there's code samples about it. And don't just show your code samples in your preferred style. If you're a JavaScript developer, you may love promises. But if I have to learn and understand promises in order to understand how your SDK works, and now I've got to figure that out first, you've added cognitive overhead, you've made this no longer easy for me to build on. 
So show in as many different styles as you can. And that doesn't mean that every example has to be shown in every style, but if you, if you use multiple styles within your, your examples, that helps the developer and gives them a clue, hey, there's more than one way to do this, and I can do this in my preferred style. I don't have to run promises. I can live and call back hell if I really feel like it. The other thing is to make doing the right thing the easy thing. So there's, this is a concept called a Norman door up on the screen. And it's named after Don Norman, who wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things. And what he describes is a door that has a handle that, says, that, that tells you everything in your being says, I'm supposed to pull on this door to open it because of the shape of the handle. But you have to push it to open it, and pulling does nothing. And it's because what they've done is they've made the easy thing to do the wrong thing. It's easy to grab a handle and pull. And your brain says, I'm supposed to pull, but you're not. So do the same thing in your API. Make sure that the easy thing, the right thing to do is the easy thing. So this goes to uh, good practi practices in your code samples. Um, make sure that your code samples act like every one of your code samples is going to end up in your most important customer's production code, because it's going to. They are going to copy and paste. I don't care how good a de developer they are. They're going to copy and paste. Make sure you put intelligent defaults in your API. <laughs> if the normal way you're going to, to do something is fill this out, and, and everybody is going to use foo as this value, use foo as the default value. Don't make developers enter that over and over and over again. Have consistency in both your docs and your API design. Don't take one thing and use the same terminology for a completely different thing. If you have dates in your API, have consistent date formats. And not just inside your API, but inside all of your company's APIs. And this is hard. Cisco is finding this very, very, very hard, especially across products, to make sure there's consistency in the API design, everything from the authentication model to uh, do we use JSON or, or XML? Do we do GraphQL? Do we do like, having consistency across lots of products is really hard. And one way to help with this is to have an API style guide. Have helpful error messages. Make sure that your error message tells somebody what they need to do to fix the problem. Have tooling, debugging tools, and logs, and things like that that are going to tell somebody what they need to do to fix the problem and help themselves. An advanced tactic is to provide a lot more tooling, like mock servers, and simulators, and even maybe IDE plugins that allow somebody to get auto-completion against your API. The easiest thing to do with this is something like a Postman collection that lets somebody, some tooling that lets them explore your API. <laughs> the fourth principle is it needs to be easy to get help. How do you ask someone for help? How, is, how responsive is that help? Can I get help from my peers, and do you offer a way to do this? Taking your docs and making sure that when somebody has a problem, the error message that they're getting, put all those error messages right in your docs so they can search it. Put it in your own search so that when somebody searches your site for your docs, that it's there. Make sure you have release notes. The release notes tell somebody, hey, did this fix my problem? Or did this release sh uh, ship a feature that I've been after? But there's a less obvious reason for release notes. Hey, my code just stopped working. Did you just deploy something? Did that something maybe fit in where my code's not working? And then have a status page that tells what the API status is. And you really want to be honest and over-communicate here. This builds trust in your developers. Which brings us to the fifth principle, which is your API, your developer experience needs to be easy to trust. And this means everything from uptime. Is it up? I can't trust you if you're down constantly. And how trustworthy is your uptime? Can I go back and look and see how often you're down? Give me historic data. Don't do the hard sell. Have trustworthy, honest communications with those developers. Explain what your business model is so that I have some assurance that you'll be around later. And if this is an internal tool, make sure that you have a transition plan communicated. If I leave the company, if I get hit by a bus, if I get abducted by aliens, how does this thing keep working and keep going? Um, for a product in the early days of Tropo, we actually open sourced the core uh, runtime 
so that that was our assurance. Hey, we're a tiny startup. You want to be able to rely on us. If we go away overnight, here's the source code. And it's not just for developers. Can your users trust what developers build? So one of the lessons that we learned at Cisco is when showing an OAuth dialog, and the OAuth dialog is pre presented by us, most users don't know what this means. Does this mean delete or I can copy everything? Most users have no idea. And the final principle is make it easy to maintain. And this is easy to maintain for you. Because if it's hard, it's not going to get done. Because who has time for extra work? So the Cisco lesson, what we've learned here is that this has to be baked into the product. You can't tack on a developer experience later. You have to think about it in the product design. And your product teams need to own this. So I want you to start thinking of the developer experience of everything that you build. Think about who else is going to use this thing and how you can make them more awesome. And if there's any questions, I will be out in the hall to, uh, to answer them if you want to talk about this more.